Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. In New York City, you have certain people who grow up in the city, who, who, who become New York City. They're involved in New York City, and they become actors, directors, writers. Today, I'm fortunate to have someone. I have a kid from Brooklyn. I have Tony Lobianco. Thank you very much. So, Tony, you were born in Brooklyn, and you were saying to me, you know, I grew up not too far in the Bensonhurst neighborhood. You were born in Brooklyn, and your, your mother and father moved around, but always in the Bensonhurst neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So tell me about growing up, you know, as a kid. Uh, I am so fortunate to have been born in Brooklyn. A uh, lot of great, wonderful people have come from Brooklyn. I think, I think it has, has to do with uh, um, combat. Uh, when I say combat, I mean, you know, growing up in my time, nobody had money that, we, that I knew. And my father was a taxi cab driver, had his own taxi cab, you know, not his own cab, taxi cab. Mother was a housewife and I have two brothers. And uh, headquarters was my house in Brooklyn. My mother had eight brothers. And so every Sunday, of course, dinner was at our house. And uh, having eight uncles uh, helped me understand a more mature attitude. You know, now, now, you're a product of the New York City school system. Yes. You went to public school, you went to junior high school, and then you said you were living on like 18th Avenue, I think? 18th Avenue, You were living on Street. 18th Avenue, 49th Street, and it was really convenient for you to go to this vocational school called Grady. Yes. But it's, it's interesting, when you were growing up, you had no idea that you were going to become an actor, a director, a writer. I mean, tell me the story about this teacher who inspired you at Grady? Well, you're right. I, I grew up uh, when I was 10 years old. I was living on 18th Avenue, 49th Street. And, I, and the, you know, who had guidance in terms of, of your qualifications? Not that I had any at that time. I was a baseball player. You know, every kid is in Brooklyn, a boxer, all that. All yeah, that golden stuff. gloves golden and everything. Golden gloves, all that stuff. So uh, when it came time for me to go to high school, you went to the, next, to the school that was closest to you, which happened to be William E. Grady. Otherwise, you would have gone to New York trip. New York trip, where my brother went uh, later on, five years younger, my brother John. So uh, when I went to this school uh, with a trade school, which I had no interest and no talent for anything like that, I went to the, I took commercial arts because my brother had taken it before me, who had talent for that subject matter. But I was fortunate enough, really fortunate enough, to have a teacher who, uh, which I respect so much. Teachers. Was it your Jewish girlfriend who introduced you to the teacher? I remember you said something. 
I had a Jewish girlfriend at the time, and of course her mother was not too happy having me <laughs> as a potential boyfriend, a boyfriend of her daughter's. And but she was a friend of the teachers. That's and uh, the teacher uh, took an interest in me. I'm not quite sure if it wasn't on the behalf of the mother to try to get me away from the daughter or not, but whatever it was, she was a speech and drama teacher in Brooklyn. Which in was a, unusual because Grady was a vocational school. Absolutely, so the uh, fortunate and lucky to have this teacher who took an interest in me and the fact that I was very, very dramatic. I came from a dra dramatic family, uh, the eight uncles and the brothers and so on and so forth. And like everybody else, we went to a lot of movies. And you were not allowed to, I mean, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, you know, our hands always have to move, you know. I mean, that was our dramatic. You know? If we weren't <laughs> able to hold our hands, we'd have a big problem. Right. I'm hanging on to the couch now. Are you kidding? So, <laughs> so uh, um, uh, she then used to cut me out of class to be in her class and she, we would talk about uh, life and uh, interesting the way she taught. Uh, as we spoke to each other, she would correct my speech. And uh, I would, you know, Brooklyn kid, I would say, uh, I'm going, I'm waiting for the buzz, you know. Uh, and she would say, I don't, I don't, first of all, I don't hear the, it's a bus. And I, and it's not with, I mean, it's not with, it's with, I don't hear the TH. So, you know, it was like somebody, nobody ever told me that. Nobody ever mentioned any of that to me. And she did, and I liked her. So when I would talk with her, and I love that way of teaching. She got you involved to take a, uh, uh, to, to, to go for uh, a role, right? When you were Well, great. yeah, it was, there happened to be, again, luck. Uh, there happened to be a contest coming around the schools, uh, and it was the declamation contest. And so being the leader, that was the president of the class, I was, uh, I was all that, and boxing and all that stuff. Uh, in fact, to give you an idea who I was when I was a kid, when I was eight years old, I had my own stickball team, which consisted of 12 and 13 year olds. So that kind of leadership led into the idea that uh, the contest comes around, naturally I enter it. And fortunately I won uh, for my class, for my school. And then before you know it, I here I was representing Brooklyn in the city finals. The so five boroughs. So let's talk about the city finals because that really is a, a changing part of your life. It helped you change. Absolutely, because I, I mean, the things that I recall mostly is her face. Her face, seeing this young Brooklyn, uh, tough kid in, uh, in the streets coming and doing Cyrano de Bergerac. And her face was just beaming to see me up on stage. And I just remember her face as I was performing this piece, how proud and happy she was. And that made me feel great, you know. And uh, I came in second in the city finals, and it was the time when communism was in the 50s, 50s, and uh, this young young guy did a speech about America and, and against communism and so on, and he won. And he wasn't that good, but uh, <laughs> he now, won Now, anyway. the interesting story, because we're gonna continue on, is you were a really good baseball player. Uh, you were, and, and you even played against the legendary Sandy Koufax. Right? I did. So tell me about that. Sandy Koufax, can you imagine? Uh, Sandy Koufax, who, uh, who? Lafayette. Lafayette, we played his school, and I was busy doing something in this, probably f for this contest, and I came to the game late. I was the uh, all-star first baseman for the Journal American All-Stars. Uh, and I came late to the game because I was doing this uh, rehearsal. And I said, what's going on? They said, this guy's throwing a no-hitter against us. I said, put me in, put me in. I got in, I, was the, I faced him, I was the last batter to face Sandy Koufax while he's pitching a no-hitter, and I got a fly ball to the outfield and out, but I hit the ball, which now, is a miracle. Now, there's another interesting thing. Didn't you try out for the Brooklyn Dodgers? I did, I did. I had a, it's a great story. I had, a, had this tryout with the Brooklyn Dodger rookies, and Al Campanis was the scout. Al Campanis then became, he, oh, I remember he said to us, remember, nobody but nobody walks on this field. When your foot touches Dodger dirt, you run. And this is the old Ebbets Field. That's Ebbets Field. And I remember when my foot touched Dodger dirt, I got a nosebleed. 
I was so, so excited that I was bleeding all over my glove, my uniform, and I was out in the outfield trying to look at the billboards, you know, what I saw on the TV, and I couldn't get the nose to stop bleeding. By the time I did, everybody was assigned to where they were going and so on and so forth. So that didn't turn out well. But years later, I became very good friends with Tommy Lasorda, the great manager of, of the then Los Angeles Dodgers, and Al Campanis was now the general manager. And he and I, and all three of us, became very good friends. And I'm sitting in the, his box with him, with Al Campanis, who was the scout back then, now the general manager. And I'm sitting and we're watching Doc Gooden pitch against Fernando Valenzuela. And for those who don't know who those guys are, they were the young sensations of, the, of that time. And they were pitching for the first time together in, in Los Angeles. And I watched Doc, the Dodgers had a, got a runner on first base. And I watched Doc Gooden go into his windup. And I said to Al Campanis, you could run on this guy. Look how, look how he goes into his motion. He comes set up here. You don't come set up here. He comes set up here and then kicks and goes all the way. That's when you run, you know. So, boom, he got on the phone, called down to the dugout. Boom, he stole the second base. <laughs> so, so you so, became a good scout. I, got a good scout. I still am a very good scout. So, so now <laughs> let's go back. You graduate Grady. Yeah. You came in second place uh, on Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, you were a Golden Glove also. And you said, look, I got to get a job. You get a job at A.C. Nielsen? A.C. Nielsen, yes. And it was just one of those jobs at the high school, you know, with connection and getting getting their people school. Uh, school. I had no interest, but I did have an interest because I had graduated. I won this award in the school, a little trophy they gave me for being the contest. And that was the best thing I did. I wasn't good enough to play baseball. I wasn't good enough to be a professional boxer. Uh, I wasn't, uh, you know. So how do you get to the uh, the drama school? I get to the drama school because the girlfriend, Faye, the, the Jewish girlfriend, uh, makes the calls for me. I, I, I was a little shy, even with all that bravado. I was really shy socially. And so she made the calls for me and went to the dramatic workshop. My instruction right was... Right near Lindy's, correct? Right near, yeah, we were cap where the Capitol Theater used to be. For those who have gray hair, know where the Capitol Theater was, but it was right across from where the Winter Garden is, uh, on, on Broadway and 50 some 50th Street, and uh, Lindy's was right, I think, on 51st Street or so. But anyway, um, uh, she made the calls. I got the appointment. I was accepted in the school, and then I did not want to work at this A.C. Nielsen place much longer. And then they gave me scholarships all over the place to this school, and I got to do got all the plays. And as an, as an interested actor, because I was, you know, I, just like I played baseball, I am ferocious when I uh, when I play ball. Uh, I mean, I'm all out. You can, you know, if I'm going, I'm going to. Pete Rose is my kind of ball player, you know. And as much or least talent as I have, I'm going to push myself to the end. The same thing I did with when I went to acting school. I figured, hey, if I'm going to do this, we're going to take the mountain. We're going to take the mountain. With my, the way I always with my uncles and my brother and so on and so forth. So uh, when I got there, I said, hey, you guys got a stage here. Let's put on a stage. Let's put on some plays. And as an actor, I wanted to know everything. I wanted to know how to direct. I wanted to know about lighting. I wanted to know about costumes and, and how to mop the stage and what, and which I did. I did all of that. And with, you told, with, with and you told me an energy. interesting story. You know, you know you're, you're 20 years of age at this time, and then you... You portray what a sixty-year-old, or a, well, tell me yeah. about that. Well, that's you see. To me, the idea of acting were actors like Laurence Olivier, uh, when when Marlon Brando didn't play himself, uh, Alec Guinness, uh, you know, Michael Redgrave, the great actors portraying other people, and that to me is acting, not being you. You're always you, but who you are is a piece of clay, molding yourself into other human beings. And so the first thing this uh, d acting teacher did was uh, put me in ballerina sh uh, tights and play a butterfly. You know, uh, here I am, this Golden Gloves fighter and this kiss kid, and I didn't bother me at all. You know, let's go. You know, that's, and I did that, and then then I portrayed uh, much older people. In fact, you might see a picture coming up of of uh, when I was 21. In one picture, and right next to it, there's another picture where I'm 65, right. and it's the same character. Now, what happens about the Three Penny Opera? 
Ah, Three Penny Opera. Uh, when I was in acting school, Josh Logan, the great director, Joshua Logan, he sent me up for my first reading. And it was, it was uh, Carmen Capalbo was the director of a play called Faster Faster that never got on. But I was going up to, for, to the, do the reading and the name of the character was Nick Bianco, close enough. And uh, so I'm playing a, a young gigolo making romance with this uh, woman an old woman by, by a pool in California. So I go up there and it's a huge, empty theater. I'm only used to a 50 seat theater and I'm going to a Broadway stage, huge, empty. And Carmen Capalbo, the great director of the Three Penny Opera and others, uh, was the director of this piece. And so uh, I had a line, one of the lines in the piece said, hey, don't tell me the truth. I'm not, don't I look like a Michelangelo statue? And, the, and <laughs> you know, it's, and Carmen laughed so much he fell out of the, into the aisle. And so uh, not knowing anything, I was, what, 20, 21, something like that. I called him the next day, and I said, good, do I have the job? <laughs> I, knew, I didn't know that was not the protocol. He said, well, Tony, you were very good. Uh, if you don't get that part, you're certainly going to get the standby. Well, the next day I called him and I said, what do I, which one, part do I have? He said, I'll tell you the truth. We're not going to do the play. It's been canceled and so on and so on. But I want you to be in the Three Penny Opera. I said, what's that? He said, because I'm still in, I'm in acting school. He said, you haven't seen it? Go, go down. I said, I'll put a ticket for you. You go down and see it. Went down there, saw this play, was knocked on my tuchus. Yeah, and Jerry, it, Jerry Orbach was he wanted me to. He wanted me to do the street singer. Jerry Orbach was the street singer because Jerry was going to move into Mac the Knife, Ma, uh, Mac Keith, a role of that sings, uh, you know. Anyway, I go down, I see it, I'm blown away. He said, he said, okay, you want to do the, that part? It's a big part. You know, it's the song, the key song. And I said, I can't do that. I says, what do you mean? I said, I can't sing. He said, can you yell loud? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, then you can do it. I said, no. He, I said, wait a minute. First of all, why do you want to hire me? He says, what do you mean? I said, he said, I saw you did a very good reading. I said, yeah, but that was just a reading. You know, I'm, I, 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 was, I, I wasn't at my best. He said, but I can see you're a good actor. I said, I'm better than that. He said, what do you mean? I said, let me do something on my terms, okay? He said, I said, you want, he said to me, you want to audition for me? I said, yeah. He said, you already did that. I said, no, no, no I want to show you something else. So he, so he said, okay. I went down to the Theater de Lise where the show was playing. And uh, I, met, I came in, he said, you're, uh, the stage manager said to me, are you ready? I said, I won't be ready for 20 minutes. Went upstairs, changed into this character, came down, 60-year-old man. I came down. They didn't know who it was. They chased, chased me down the, the aisle. And uh, the guy said, excuse me, excuse me. We're having auditions here. I'm so, then he realized it must be me. So I get up on stage, put a bunch of chairs around there, make myself a little box. And I do a six-page monologue from the adding machine, Elmer Rice's adding machine. Well, after it's over, they both come up on stage, tears rolling down their face. And then Carmen says to me, look, look, now will you take the part? <laughs> I, said, I said, now I'll show you I can't sing. And, and, you know, and, <laughs> and then you were involved with the Triangle Studio. Oh, yeah, the Triangle was a... Uh, with Roy. But, I, but to, to end that story, he, he put me in, the, because it sounds like I didn't get to do the part. But he, he said, uh, let me, uh, I said, he said, okay, okay, you, I want you as a member of the gang. I said, uh, what part? He said, uh, one of the, Bob the Saw. I said, uh, okay, do you mind if I play him? I think he should be played by a very fat man. He said, uh, I said, okay, is that okay with you? I'll play him as a fat man. He said, sure, Tony, you do whatever you want. And then you got dressed so up. So I too. played as a fat man. I had a putty nose on and a whole thing of the cheeks and so on and so forth. And then at the end, I had a, another part where all the other gang members would put rags over their faces and so on because they were playing beggars in the area scene. Not me, of course not me, it's a character. So I do a whole other makeup job. I took the putty, I do a nose, a long nose, I put gray hair, I put cuts on my face, gray beard, a gabushka, a babushka. And, uh, and I have a line that says, that must be the guard of honor. Little do they expect they'll be seeing us today. Well, that was my line. Every night I got an applause on that line because it was so startling and they never expected the intensity uh, of it, and uh, and uh, it was it was a joy just to, to I did that for a year, you know, at, at forty five dollars a week. Now you also said to me when you were acting, as you said, you had eight 
uh, you, your parents had eight uh, rel eight brothers and sisters. You, you, My mother, yeah. You, your mother and father were your best. Uh, they went to summer stock. They traveled all over. Fantastic. I had, I see, I, uh, my, my mother and father were the greatest fans, supporters. Anything their sons wanted to do was the greatest. And I never remember a day in my life that I didn't see, have my father, who had worked 12 hours on a cab, come up those stairs saying, where's my boys? Where's my boys? And give me a kiss and a hug every day of my life. That's wonderful. Yeah. And so, they also supported <clears throat> every, every time we did a weekend show at the school. They came every weekend and brought all their friends from the neighborhood and so on and so forth. And then they would travel three, four hundred miles by car to come see me do a walk-on on some of stock. So right. let's talk about the uh, Triangle. Yes. What happens there? How do you the get The Triangle that? Theater was a theater I had on 88th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. Uh, I was an artistic director of that with my partner, Bert Brinkerhoff. And uh, we did some wonderful things. We discovered... Uh, playwrights like Jason Miller, who wrote that championship season, which I don't know if it's still on, but it was just playing. Uh, and uh, that's, he won the Pulitzer Prize for that. And we did all his plays before that. I produced them, I directed them, I acted them, and we did everything. And uh, uh, so he was, and Roy Scheider, my, uh, God, God rest his soul, uh, my co-star from uh, French Connection and Seven Ups, and I've done five or six uh, other uh, adventures with him, other movies, televisions, and what have you. Let's talk about the uh, the honeymoon killers because ah, yes. so that that's a great story. You play the role of Ray Fernandez. Yes, and that's he's a Spanish guy, and yes. he's he's a gigolo, right? He is a, he is a gigolo. He's a he's a, uh, a lover, and uh, unfortunately, uh, when the women that he is romancing do not uh, cooperate with his. A desire to have some money and want to cause a problem for him, he has to kill them, unfortunately. But it's his profession. It's but, his wait, but, but, but what was more important was when you were uh, being casted for that role yes. and it was Spanish. What happens? Well, I'll tell you, I, I was working at the Triangle Theater and my uh, friend uh, uh, Marilyn Chris, uh, an actress who knew my abilities to play different roles and so on and so forth. She said, there was a movie being cast. And so I called over there and they said, no, 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 we're seeing, how old are you? I said, oh, I'm 28. And she said, oh, no, the guy we're seeing is 46 and uh, sort of over the hill. And, uh, and you know, we're only seeing authentic Spanish-speaking people anyway. Okay. So a couple of weeks passed and Marilyn says to me, they haven't cast that part yet. I said, she said, you should go up. So I went up. And the woman said, no, what are you doing here? What, you know, we're wrong. She, I said, what do you want? She said, uh, she said, I want this force. I said, just a minute. So I turned in my chair, I put my hand on my hair, pulled it straight back, and I spoke to her in the Spanish accent. And she went, oh, my God. Oh, my God, I'll, I'll send you in. So I went in, and I spoke to the producers only with the Spanish accent. And they hired me, you see. And then they said to me, would you uh, mind reading the actresses? And I spent a week reading the other actresses for the other parts and uh, never spoke to them without the Spanish accent ever until one of the producers said, do you think we can send them to school to learn to speak the English better? And so they, the casting woman finally said, I've got to tell you, he doesn't have an accent. And they said to me, Tony, talk to us without the accent. I said, no, sir, not until I sign the contract which I never did, I didn't sign the contract, I didn't speak to them ever without the, without the accent until I did sign the contract. Because I, that has been the story of my life. The idea of, I mean, how many roles I have not been right for that I had to go up and prove that I could do, including Rocky Marciano. When I did Rocky Marciano, the, uh, Louis DiGiamo, the casting agent, wanted me to do it. And the head of uh, ABC said, absolutely not. So I said to Lou, I said, let me, do, let me audition for it. So I auditioned, I changed my face, I changed my hair, I changed my whole thing. And when they showed it to him on tape, he said, that's the guy I want, get him, who's he? I said, that's Tony LaBianco. I think, uh, LaGuardia. LaGuardia, LaGuardia, my man. Uh, you know, he was one quarter Jewish, you know. Um, his, his mom, uh, Cohen. Uh, he was, he was a... Uh, uh, a fighter for you and me and all the people, and a man of the people, for the people, 
and he was the mayor, uh, 12 years, three-term mayor, 12 years, uh, a great hero of, of uh, Mayor Koch, and uh, in fact, Koch had his picture over his desk, and used his desk, by the way. He had to raise it up because Koch was much taller. But LaGuardia was a man who fought so many battles and, and responsible for so many things that we don't know about. So I did this, I do this one-man show on him. Uh, we, first, we first did it at Albany at the Ag Theater, and uh, we, did it, we did it for N uh, WNET, and it won five PBS, right. Emmys, yeah, daytime Emmys, and um, uh, Koch actually narrated the show. And then you did it uh, recently, and I a did couple it on years. on Broadway. Now you I were in a view from the bridge also. View from the bridge in 1983, I believe it was. I was the first one to play Eddie Carbone, the lead uh, of Arthur Miller's A View from the Bridge in a full length play on Broadway. What about yeah. the uh, the Dodgers, Detroit, what was that one? Yanks three, Detroit, nothing, top of the seventh. That was the OB. I won the OB for that, yeah. Yeah, that was a great one. I that was that was fun because again, Hal Prince was the original director. And uh, he got into something with the producers, and that didn't work out. And uh, when I went on stage with Hal, he said, what are you doing? I said, what? He said, you're pitching left-handed. I said, yeah. He said, well, you got your back to the audience. I said, oh, well, I'll go pitch on the other side of the stage. He said, that's the weakest side of the stage. I said, okay, so I'll pitch right-handed. So <laughs> he said, you can pitch with both hands, playing a professional Yankee player? I said, I make myself do it, you know? In fact... It, I don't got to tell you, I won the Obi for that, but I'll tell you how it saved my life. But I'm doing a film in Italy, I'm working with Maud Adams, and she's on a bus fleeing, and I've chosen, I choose my characters to be left-handed or right-handed according to their personality. And so I chose Miss character to be right-handed. And so uh, the director says to me, listen, uh, I, I want you to shoot at the bus. When she, uh, I said, I'll shoot at the bus. What do you mean shoot at the bus? I'm a New York cop. You can't shoot at a fleeing bus. It's going to kill somebody else. Now I'm running down the street with the gun in hand, right-handed, and by so over here comes a real police car with guns out the window. They cut me off. I go, oh my gosh. They come out, they say, and pe people are screaming, it's a movie, it's a chinema, chinema. Then they were all white. And the, the talk in the, in the car was, well, shoot him, kill him, kill him, shoot him. If I fire the gun, I'm a dead man. If I am left-handed, I walk down there like this, so here, I don't see them, and if I do, I go like this, and they blow me away. So, you know, <laughs> 30 minutes is not enough time to it's go not. over the life <laughs> of Tony <laughs> Lopez. And, to, and I try to speak fast. I know, but, <laughs> you know, for a man who's been an actor, a director, an author, uh, a producer, uh, you have truly been a New York story, and thanks for being here today. Thank you so much. Anytime. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling & Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, 
The Wyckoff Group, Urban American. 